Let us pray together. Gracious God Almighty, we thank you for the privilege of being able to enter into your word as we do so today. We ask that you would meet us here, that the words on the page would become alive for us, that we might understand them, and even more than that, take them in and make them part of our hearts, our very purpose, our reason for being. All this we ask in the wonderful name of Jesus, the Christ, our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> Not long ago, I was having a conversation with a friend that noted up until they were about 40, death was something they were quite unfamiliar with. <laughs> it was something that happened rarely in their world, something that their parents seemed to know something about, but nothing they had to deal with. They had never really gone to a wake or a visitation or to a funeral. And then, like someone turned on a light switch at age 40, it was now their responsibility to go to all these things, and worse, that it was now people they knew and loved who were suffering and dying. She asked, what happened? Jesus knew that Lazarus was dying, yet, like in last week's story, he didn't make it in time to perform a healing. This time, John tells us he deliberately lingered, waiting, it seems, until Lazarus was dead and gone for four whole days before Jesus managed to make it to where he was. One might note that Jesus' healing ministry, the one that got most people's attention, a sign that the kingdom of God was present, was now over. Healing, it turns out, was not only possible, but an essential mission and ministry, not just of Jesus, but more importantly, of the people of God. <clears throat> and Jesus dutifully handed it over to the disciples and the successive church. We are now to be the healers in this world. A message that the apostles got very clear about, even getting themselves jailed for it when they healed in the temple. A ministry objective the church often sets aside because we think it's too hard and too costly. But while the healing ministry of Jesus was handed off, as it were, to the church, a new ministry was about to unfold. And for it to unfold, death, not healing, was essential. Some of them said, he gives sight to the blind. Why couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? Their judgment of Jesus was harsh. But it was right on the mark. The healer was no longer healing. They spoke the truth. They judged Jesus. Have you ever judged Jesus? It's a fairly common activity, actually. Putting God in the dock, in the spot of the defendant. God should have, could have acted on our behalf in the midst of tragedy, but did not. We struggle, we suffer, we experience loss, and we judge God as being uncaring or inattentive or unjust. The study of how to understand why bad things happen to good people is called theodicy. As defined by Alvin Plantinga, the analytic philosopher at Notre Dame University, theodicy is the answer to the question of why God permits evil. Theodicy is defined as a theological construct that attempts to vindicate God in response to the evidential problem of evil that mitigates against the existence of an omnipotent and an omnibenevolent deity. For those of you who are familiar with it, the book and the, the book and the movie The Shack deal with this same concern, as does Rabbi Harold Kushner's book when bad things happen to good people. We judge Jesus because we see that he is inadequate as Messiah because he can't keep us or the ones we love or even the institutions we care passionately about from dying. He doesn't need to. And that we cannot understand. We want our parents, our spouses, our children, our neighbors, innocents of all kinds, and even communities and neighborhoods and schools and churches to live forever. <clears throat> We're not wired to deal well with death, with injustice, with violence, 
with the tearing apart of our lives, though we are often quite callous about the lives of others, and feel justified, although quite often guilty, about assigning blame to God. I often have people come in my office and they say, I can no longer talk to God, I am so angry with him, I don't know what to do. You know what my advice is? Find a really big farm field. Sorry, Janet, probably your field. Um, <laughs> walk out in the middle of it and yell at God. One of two things is gonna happen. A lightning bolt will take you right there, or by the time you're done yelling at God, you may have a very different idea about who God is and what God is all about. We judge Jesus because we see him as inadequate. He gives sight to the blind. Why couldn't he keep Lazarus from dying? We find ourselves amazed at the crowds on Palm Sunday who, traveling on the road from Jericho down on the Jordan to Jerusalem, singing praises to God and then welcoming Jesus into the city of Zion as if he was a conquering king come to save his people. Though, oddly enough, riding lowly on a donkey, uh, the equivalent of the pickup truck of his generation. Not the Rolls Royce limousine or a, that a gold chariot or a white war horse would have symbolized the chosen transportation of Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, when he entered Jerusalem. The same people who, instead of praising their king of kings and lord of lords, whom they fed it with palm branches and, and their cloaks thrown on the road, on Good Friday, boo Jesus as a traitor, more heinous a person than the terrorist Judas Bar uh, Barabbas. The man let go by the governor instead of Jesus with chance by the crowd of crucify him, crucify him. Let him taste the pain of all our losses. Let him know the excruciating sense of grief. Let him experience what life can pour out when it all goes wrong, when bad things happen to good people what it is like to look in the face of those who are losing what is most precious to them and know there is nothing you can do to help or heal and there is nothing that a supposedly loving God can do either. He gives sight to the blind. Why couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? But there is a mystery here we do not understand. We see death as an enemy. Jesus does not. Lazarus, come out. Let us pray. Gracious God Almighty, we are the people of resurrection, and yet we struggle because between now and then is the enemy death. We do not know exactly how to understand all this or what to do with it. We need your presence and your power to guide us, not only through this week where we experience Jesus' death and then resurrection, but as we prepare to live in a resurrection way in all things. Give us the grace we need, for we ask it in his name. In the bulletin today, there's notes about congregational life, and as I mentioned, this is, of course, Holy Week, which means that on